everyone, thank you for joining me. Uh, so these are probably, some of them, the first time on stage, so be kind to them. I will be, you know, I'm there to protect them against any mean questions. So, um, so without further ado, I will ask you, each of you, to present who you are, who you work for, how long, how long you've been in the business, and what brought you into this incredible industry. You want me to start? You're is, next to me, it's a good the, start. Uh, can I just check if the mic's working? It is. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Martin Latrilliart. I work for a company called Triple Points. Um, if you don't know Triple Points, um, we are the investment manager for a company called Digital Nine Infrastructure, or D9. If yet again you don't know D9, we are the owner of Aquacoms. Um, I've been in the industry for just about 18 months. Um, I joined right place, right time, I think. I was in the real estate side at Triple Point beforehand. Um, and there was an opportunity shortly after the IPO for D9 to move across. So uh, working with the likes of Nigel over there in the crowd. Hi, Nigel. Um, so that's me. Good, that's me thank all. you. Claire, Claire comes from Kenya, by the way. She's joined us from as far as Kenya. Claire, start. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Wenjiko. I work for um, a company called Wayok. We mainly focus um, in connecting Africa to the rest of the world and Africa to each other. Um, I joined um, Wyok um, eight years ago, and I work with people like Nikki and my class. Uh, hi, I'm Salvador Jimenez Sanchez. I work for Red Penguin Marine. We're a subsea power and telecoms consultant on the south coast. Um, I've been with them just coming up on 15 months now, and you guessed it, sort of fell into the industry by pure chance after my undergrad, and um, yeah, the rest is history. Frankie? Hi, I'm Frankie Target. So I work for Vodafone um, in the submarine engineering team. Uh, I joined the company about two years ago, uh, straight from university uh, as part of their graduate scheme, where I, by chance, was put on a rotation in the submarine engineering team, and I absolutely loved it. So um, hopefully I'm there to stay. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm James Francis, and I'm a cable route engineer at uh, Alcatel Submarine Networks. So we're the um, global leader turnkey supplier for all your submarine systems. We manufacture, um, design, and install them for you. Uh, I've been with the company about three and a half years, moving on to four years. Um, and uh, I got into the industry completely by chance. I was a surveyor and then got headhunted to join ASN. Never thought I'd get the job, so I was pretty confident in the interviews, I think. And, uh, and they gave me a job. Cool, thank you. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Alex Overstall. I'm a technical business developer at Amazon. Uh, I've been at Amazon for about four months now, so still quite new, um, but previously was at uh, uh, ASN um, for seven years. And it seems to be a bit of a theme today, but I also fell into the industry. Um, I like a lot of graduates, I think, didn't really know what to do coming out of university. Um, I did a degree in geography with geology, really enjoyed it. I've always been a keen sailor and interested in the marine environment. Joined a uh, survey company called Guardline, who specialise in uh, marine services and offshore surveys. And through Guardline, I became aware of the submarine cable industry, doing cable route surveys for companies such as ASN and the rest, as they say, is history. Okay, great, thank you. That's a good start. No one's fainted yet. We're doing good. <laughs> so I guess maybe my first question before we go into the really key topic, which is the future of our industry. So maybe when you joined, what is the first thing, the, the thing that surprised you the most about this industry? We all come into industries with preconceptions, but what in, surprised you the most? Maybe, maybe you can go first. Um, yeah, I guess within the first two, three weeks of being a red penguin, the sheer scale of it. These weren't very local, small projects and systems. This is like mass, round continent, transatlantic, transpacific projects and how many moving parts and how many sort of industries and people like that get involved with it. And it was just unbelievable to have that connection and also being able to interact over teams and talk to so many people from around the world in the industries. And yeah, just so many doors have opened that way. Martin, you're next to me, I'm sorry. Uh, you'll be probably one of my favorite victims. So what, what surprised you the most in this industry? Um, almost everything, to be honest. Uh, coming from a real estate background, uh, everything seems a lot more, in hindsight, everything seems a lot more simple. 
uh, the planning process to get these cables launched could take five, maybe more years. Uh, the amount of capital you have to commit, I mean, from an investment standpoint, the amount of capital you have to commit to these projects, they can be half a billion, half a billion dollar projects. Um, so just adding to what Salvador said, the, the sheer scale, the planning, the complexity. Um, and from real estate, where everything seems a lot, more, a lot, a lot easier, mm. uh, definitely that, yeah. Okay. Alex? I think, f for me, the thing that still surprises me uh, and surprised me from the start was, yes, it's a massive industry, it's, it's global, the reach is huge, but it also sometimes feels quite small as well, and I think that's the thing that surprises me to this day. You come across people, they say, oh, I know X, Y, and Z from this project, or yeah, we used to work back in the day, back in this project. And I was chatting to someone earlier in, in the foyer, and it does feel like a little bit like a family in that regard. Um, you know, and I think that's a real testament to the industry that once you're in, it does engage you, it retains people because there is so much to do. But I still find it surprising. Mm -hmm. James? Um, that it exists, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the amount of people that you talk to that do not know yes. that submarine cables exist. Yes, they, yes. I think at university, the big ones, you learn about oil and gas, you learn about power cables. Fibre optics, it's not really on many people's radar. No one, you talk to speak to the general public, it's all satellites, isn't it? Um, but, yeah, and I would say that's the main thing, how unknown it is, how these are the, the biggest, longest infrastructures on the planet. No one can rival submarine telecoms as mu in terms of length. I mean, they go around the globe, but it's, it's huge, and yet not many people know about them. Mm -hmm. So that's what surprised me most. Yeah. Frankie? Yeah, I, th I think for me, it was actually the people that surprised me the most when I came into the industry. Even sitting here on this panel, we're lots of different backgrounds, um, lots of different technical roles involved, but also non-technical roles involved in the industry. And not one project would be able to be complete without those different backgrounds, without those different people, and just all working towards the same end goal. And having that variety and diversity in an industry, I just think was really nice and it really surprised me. Last but not least, Claire. Uh, yeah, so what's, uh, I'll agree with um, Alex, what he said. Um, what surprised me most was how uh, big the industry is, um, but how small it ends up looking. Um, in terms of um, the costs, I look at um, the amount of cost that is put in in just um, uh, bringing up a single link on a submarine cable or a subsea cable, and it's connecting miles and miles of countries. Um, I remember the first time um, we connected an STM-1, and it was coming from um, Nairobi to London, and um, I'm told it's up, and I'm thinking, wow. Um, so I have come to London. It's my first time to London, and I'll see where we connected to. <laughs> Finally, but yeah, uh, so it is. It is. It has caused the world to um, collapse into a very small um, piece of um, village, um, and at the same time, the cost that we are looking at is millions of dollars. Yet, when you look at that purchase order, it looks like just a piece of paper. But there's a lot of money that has been exchanged. Mm -hmm. And I think one information that has surprised me when I looked at the subsea world is that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ed. The first cable was uh, launched in 1852. If yeah, it's hard to to understand how they could have done something so incredible that long ago, and the industry has changed, but not that much. It has, but so it's it is a surprising industry in all sorts of ways. So we are following the the senior shark <laughs> panel. We're junior sharks here. I, I include myself in there. So, um, so if, you know, I, I'm at the moment, you know, this event's about the future and building the future through technology innovation, but also through the young generation. So if we look into all of each of your crystal balls, you know, in five years down, five years or 10 years down the line, what would we see if we looked at the subsea world? And you all come from different backgrounds. So please share your view of the future as you see it in your own uh, reality in your own world. So, um, you know, sorry. I'm, I'm happy to get again. <laughs> yes, um, sorry. I, I'd, I'd want to focus on a, 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 a trend I think that will emerge rather than where the whole sector will be in five years' mm -hmm. time. But um, I think Ed was touching on it when he was speaking earlier that there's going to be a 
a, as, well, demand for data is growing exponentially, um, and data needs to be stored somewhere. That's data centers. Do you know, we also invest in data centers as well as subsea. Um, and to store the data in those data centers, you need, a you need to transmit that data through the subsea cables. Um, at D9, what we invest in is um, data centers in the Nordics, um, where you've got cheap, uh, abundant, renewable power. Um, and what I think, it might sound counterintuitive, because you've got you know, Iceland, you've got 300,000 people, so you don't actually have that many people in these areas, and typically subsea cables bring you to where the people are. Um, but I think because data is cheaper to transmit than power, we're going to be seeing a lot more cables going to those less populous, cheaper renewable power areas. Okay. Um, so that's a theme I think will emerge. I mean, in Iceland, you've already got the Far Ice, the Dan Ice, the Iris is coming up. Um, you might have more cables to Alaska, to Canada. So that's a, thing, a theme that I think will be, um, will be emerging. Okay, okay. And by the way, in the audience, please join in any time. You don't have to wait at the end. If you have questions, comments, if you agree with our panelists or disagree, this is an, a, 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 um, a panel for all of you guys. So please join in as, as soon as you want. Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, you have to wait for the, the, yeah. Thanks. Hi, mine was an observation. It was um, interesting what James was saying about nobody knows about the submarine industry and submarine cables. It's about perspective. One of the other things about this industry is that it's transformational. I went to Africa when we started up WIOC, uh, the company that I work for. Submarine cable systems were just being deployed into Africa. I went through immigration with some samples of cables. The immigration officers knew what they were, and they were asking which of the two submarine cables that were wow. coming to, to, to Kenya was this one. They knew exactly what was coming because it was absolutely transformational to Kenya um, and to Africa. And that's something else that's really exciting about the industry, that you can really be part of changing things for the better. Are you sure they weren't ex wyok employees? <laughs> 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 sorry, I had to. I, I, sorry, it was too good to, to say part of my marketing team now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, good point. It's a bit of the unsung hero of today's world, the subsea, the subsea fiber cable. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Claire, if we look in Claire's crystal ball, what do we see? Um, so what I see in about... Um, five years' time, um, in my opinion, would be reduced um, regulations and policies in the different governments, which um, eventually, if you look at it, they contribute to the amount of cost um, into the submarine investment. So we're seeing a lot of, um, the, the, there's a bit of shying away from um, submarine cable uh, laying and uh, landing into different countries because of all the different policies and regulations when it comes to licensing taxation that is put in and um, and it's pulling the uh, it's contributing into the time the lead times to bring up new cables and as well as um, the cost so um, well more cables are coming in there will be embracing of cables by governments and um, some um, will see a lot of small players in the industry joining in um, to lobby governments into um, embracing what a submarine cable is um, and, con and uh, considering it as part of uh, the country's infrastructure. That will make it um, smaller or um, it will reduce the capital investment that needs to be injected in for a new cable to come in. So in, um, increasing competition, allowing more players into the industry, and also tapping countries that are still not connected. I think in Africa is just one for now. Uh, but um, there will be, we'll see more countries having more cables. Yeah. OK. Uh, uh, just jumping, Frankie. Yeah, I think to follow on from Claire, to be honest, um, I think in the next five years there might be uh, a change in more like legislation and things like that. I think as the seabed infrastructure changes, um, we're going to have more renewable energies and a lot more crowding of the seabed as capacity increase, uh, capacity demand increases and things like that. You're going to get things looking at like cable corridors, cable protection zones, and I think that we're going to have to maybe rethink our guidelines and recommendations on how we like route engineer cables and things like that because we're going to run out of room. <laughs> so I yeah. think that's a really important thing that we, we might have to focus on in the next five to ten years. Yeah, and reflecting a bit what was said earlier in the, in the senior <laughs> executive panel. Alex? So I think for me, over the next five years, personally, I think it's just going to be massive growth. I think it's going to be really, really busy. And with that period of growth, 
uh, and the, the demand coming from the OTTs as we move into a post-COVID world and the demand for cloud computing, I think that's really going to drive some exciting technologies as well and possibly some more automation, whether it be machine learning or automated surveys, better plowing technologies. I think the continued growth is really going to push the industry to challenge preconceptions. So over the next five years, I think, yeah, it's going to be really exciting and incredibly busy. Okay. James? Yeah, I'd actually agree with, with Alex, especially on the marine side of things where I am. It's um, pick up on automation. I think it is coming. It, well, it's already here, to be honest. I won't start naming the survey companies in case I miss a few. But uh, <laughs> um, they are happening already, and we're seeing them in, in our route design and um, uh, all over the world, actually, where we can best utilise all these solutions. So we're talking drones, there's autonomous autonomous uh, surveys going on now and uh, topographic stuff on land too. And I think um, also then in the installation side of things, we're, we're developing, you know, touchdown technologies and things like that. So it's, it's a lot of advancement and I think automation is going to play a part in it. Okay. So I'm doing last but not least. Um, my academic background is marine biology, so I think something that's probably looked as now as a bit of a negative, plowing cables into the seabed is probably not the most environmentally friendly, but with movements such as net zero and net gain, where the cable industry can have a positive impact on the environment we interact with. So when you're putting in a cable, you can go back and it's measurably, measurably better than how it originally was, measure, um, by planting seagrass, oyster restorations, things like that. So I think, yeah, in five years' time, it'll probably become more of a systematic or wider view on like how we should be putting these cables and using it as an almost a marketing point okay. instead of a negative. Anyone in the industry wants to share their crystal balls? Oh, we cannot hear you. Let's try again. I'll try again. Okay. Okay. I just was wondering to drop a question to the panel. Does yes. it work? Terrific. Uh, I was wondering again, from the perspective, how the things will evolve. Uh, as we know, like now, we all know the industry by some names of huge companies which take over, over the world, they're super global. But there's also a trend that the small spin-out company, very innovative, gets risen up from out of the research groups or stuff like that. What do you think is going to be a trend like in the future, how this kind of balance will change? Will it be more smaller companies or they will merge together or will they will be acquired by industry giants or that industry giants will stay and those guys will die? What's your, what's your opinion about That's it? That's quite a mean question. So I guess, I guess what she wants to know is the ecosystem. How is the ecosystem going to evolve? Is it going to remain the same, you think? Or is, it, is there, a shift, there will be a shift of power? Will it be a consolidation? That's kind of, is that, that's the question, correct? Yeah. I'm happy to start. I mean, we, we could go on for hours about whether the big four or mm. the, the OTTs will get broken up. I, I don't think that will happen. I think the OTTs, you, we will see consolidation within the, the markets. They'll just see the opportunities and it'll make financial sense from an investment point of view. Okay, any other views on that? Will it become, it's actually a question I asked some of my panelists, I was in Singapore at the Submarine World Conference, and will, the, you know, will it be only an OTT type of business going down the line? Is there still space for the operators and carriers to build cables? I think there always will be a, a market and a place for, for the others. I don't think it's just the OTTs, but they obviously, let's be honest, the major players now, and a lot of what we do, especially ASN, and we know the others, Subcom, NEC, etc. we're laying cables for the, the usual suspects, and they are also technology companies, so they are also pushing the automation, the all of that sort of stuff, so a lot of it's coming from them as well. So I think, yeah, they are, I don't think they'll ever break up, but I think um, they are going to dominate, but I still think there's definitely a space for space for the others, other other telecom companies. Yeah, I, th this is a personal view, absolutely, but I would wholeheartedly echo um, what James said. I think there will always be a role for smaller independent uh, companies and, and cable providers as well. I don't, I don't think that will change. That's a personal view. And also, if we look also in the crystal ball, uh, I've heard some interesting things last week in Singapore where um, there's a, a role for maybe subsea cable to do good where there's some technology, and, and please correct me, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in that, but depending on the, st the, the status of the cable, if there's some variation, then they may detect some uh, geo, um, oh, 
help me guys, <laughs> geo... Um, Seismic activities. Yes, geo -seismic tsunamis. activities. Yeah. So they're looking into that as a, 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 actually a pot potential use of subsea cable, something we would never have thought about before, which is really exciting, I think, because maybe then that will open up the industry to more people seeing it as, as a potential industry to work in. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of good work being done uh, by ICPC Suboptic as well in, in that forum, looking at how to make uh, submarine cables beneficial to wider society in terms of tsunami warnings, earthquake monitoring, you know, even monitoring for whale migrations. You know, there are technologies out there that can help with that. Um, and I think it's absolutely something the industry should, should develop and look at more. And it's probably just another reason why the submarine cable industry, coming back to why we're here, is so interesting for young people to get inv involved in is because it is so multifaceted and there are so many avenues to explore. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, Claire. Okay, so to add on that, I also think um, we won't say that OTT is actually dropping off um, the submarine, ownership of the submarine. They're joining now. Um, we can see Meta and Google um, investing into the submarine cable. However, um, what I think we're going to see is a lot of partnerships uh, between uh, these OTT players and the smaller players in the industry. You'll see a lot of play uh, players in the industry participate in uh, building the terrestrial um, networks or the data centers. And these ones, um, what, we, what I think we'll see is uh, partnerships coming together, partnering with the big um, players in the industry to actually contribute the whole uh, worldwide connectivity. Um, and basically each of the companies gaining from each other. At the end of the day, um, these smaller players will be part of the submarine industry um, in their own extension. Okay. Uh, yes, following Frankie. on from what you said about um, it, what you heard in Singapore, I just think there's a lot of unlocked potential in submarine cables that I think uh, the youth might have um, an insight to, that you can get so much data from just putting <laughs> some electrical connectivity through those cables and what you can get back through repeaters and things like that, that they could be used for so many other purposes while also transmitting the data. That I think that there's a, a, an area for the youth and to work with the um, knowledge that exists in the industry already to maybe have some different purposes for these cables as well. And that might be why we, where we move to in the future. Okay. I think as well, um, it's, it's another thing with fibre as well. You can do more with it than just, than just send data. We, there are already systems out there. I know of Japan they do seismic monitoring stuff. Um, you have oceanographic research cables that are all fibre. A lot of fibre cables go to oil and gas platforms. Um, there's also reservoir monitoring systems, which are all fibre. So there's, there's a lot of utility with fibre that I think we're finding more and more, like the PRM, the reservoir monitoring, is a new thing that's come on the scene. So there's, there's always a big versatility with fibre, and there's more we can do with it, I think. Okay. Anyone wants to add anything? Yes, in the, in the back there's someone. You need a microphone in the back. Um, hello, my name is uh, Ken Astrop from City of London. Uh, I just got two questions. Um, going by my experience, I've been in the industry for IT almost 20 years. And growing up, we don't have things that is very visible for kids to actually get engage you. So my question is to you on the panel. Obviously, I could see probably you are in the range of 30, 30, you know, less than 35, I believe. But to young kids, how do you actually incorporate? Because some people don't even know about it. Like to, in the world of today, coding is visible to everyone. Kids know how to code, they know about it. Some people don't even know about submarine at all. I, you know, knew about it by chance because I've been in the industry for a while, you know, getting there. So how do you incorporate young kids that they're not in, they're not, you know, into IT at all. The first one is for Claire in Africa. How do you encourage young kids? I'm from Nigeria, and to be honest, you thought the world is moving fast, but some area or rural area, they don't even have connection at all. Not talk of internet or Facebook or phone or laptop or desktop or anything. So how do you incorporate that? And the second question to the rest, here in the UK, 
During the lockdown, there's a lot that happened. I work with young, ki young kids, and I found out that some kids don't even have access to anything at all. And that was a big challenge. The world is moving forward today. ITO is everywhere. So how do you incorporate young kids to know about submarine in the near future? In the next five, 10 years, things are going to be different to what we are today. About 40 years ago, the way things are, it's been slow. Yeah, it's moving fast, but it's not fast enough. So how do you incorporate young? Because young kids are the leader of tomorrow. So how do you engage them to be a part of it? Yeah. It's, a, it's actually it's a good question, because really, today we are about the the generation that is about to join the industry or has the potential to join, but I agree with you, it needs to go all the way down to the very young children. And from my point of view, I think it's, it's, it's informing children, not maybe on the technology, but what it enables, maybe, you know. There's some videos on the internet, but not many. These, these are maybe, that's the first event I've known just on, on, for that type of generation. But you need to maybe, it's part of our role to give back as an industry, all of us in the industry. It's time for us to give back to the young generation, spend time educating, showing our qualities, and maybe bring them in, you know, and say, come and visit this, this uh, well, maybe not cable shape, that would be difficult, but Science come, museum. you know, touching, touching, and there's nothing like that when you're young, touching and say, okay, I understand now, and that will bring them to, but that's my point of view. I don't know if you are, because you're younger than me, <laughs> maybe you have a different point of view? Yeah, I would actually say that I don't know if anyone saw, um, but during the pandemic, submarine cables actually went viral on TikTok. Mm. People discovered what they were via the media of TikTok. People didn't know they existed, and then suddenly out of nowhere they were viral. And I think it's maybe a, engaging with youth and children, maybe through their own avenues that they are used to, so yes, you can have science museums and things like that, but they are online. They are on their iPads, they're on their phones, and I think engaging through social media and apps like TikTok that maybe the older generation don't know about or don't know how to use, or not to be <laughs> offensive to anyone here, but I think engagement through the avenues that they are used to and that they see every day, I think, is the way to forward yes, to go. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think just following on from what Frank said, is, is engagement at an early age, like a really quite young age, actually. You know, science museum stuff was, that was talked about down here. I think in, engaging kids early in science, but also opening up their eyes that it doesn't have to just be science. I did geography, you know, that's, that's not science, and here I am. So I think <coughs> it, engaging in kids early on and presenting them with a view of the industry you know, all of the good bits. And there are so many good bits about the industry. You know, the travel, the ships get people excited. You know, you, there's a lot of engagement that you could have with kids from an early age. And I think that's, that's mm. the really important mm, part mm, of it. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Um, I also yes. like what Mike said. Um, he carried a cable um, and went to the immigration. And um, you see, if we have these bits of life examples, real-time examples, and as the kids are going through their programming and doing all those things, these, um, the programming and programming is um, a lot of digital um, code. Um, you can bring this and say this digital code um, can be transmitted via this cable. Um, in school, for science, we learn about um, optical uh, signals and all that. Um, and this cable, uh, as an example, is uh, one of the examples on how you can use optical signals for communication. So you use their their level of um, knowledge to give them an example of what is out there. Um, it will um, uh, get us out of that situation where we actually do not know what a subsea cable is. Um, you know it exists, but probably you're not actively part of it, but you do know about it. Mm -hmm. So just bringing out, um, making them aware of this is how it is and these are the basics on how it works. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it's something that keeps coming up in sort of office chat and anyway we progressed it where one of my colleagues ended up going into one of the local primary schools near Portsmouth and it was quite literally sort of a hands-on environment where it was two cans of beans and a string and they were like, this is how, you know, in, the most, in its most basic form, pulses are sent from A to B. And it was, you know, just making them aware of it at a very, very young age. And, you know, the feedback we had from the teachers in the school was fantastic. You know, kids were engaged, they were asking questions the next day. And it's just sort of trying to find that niche, like, say, whether we target very young primary school age to make them aware of it, or do we go pre-GCSE so they can cater their exam and topic choices if they, you know, feel like they want to come into the industry that way. Yeah. And it's, you know, again, it's 
purely, I mean, essentially down to awareness and going to schools, universities, colleges and saying, you know, this is available, this is here. There's mm. so many paths you could follow down it. Yeah. And I think, I think we have to see it as an industry. Um, it's our responsibility. Take control. Stop wait. We need to stop hoping someone else will do it. We need to take that seriously. And maybe just an idea that came up just right now. Maybe each company should have a program and each you know, they have to spend so, many, so much time going to different schools at different levels, very young, all the way to the end of the university, and share, like we're doing, maybe having a panel, and then so that people understand we exist and how cool it is. And with the young people, I really agree with the touching and, you know, saying, okay, this is that, what is the result? So I think it's maybe it's each of us to, to, to take that action point. Yes? A, a point on uh, Frankie's comment there. We've got some pretty senior decision makers and influencers in the subsea cable industry here. Did any of us know that we went viral on TikTok? Who goes into TikTok? So there's a disconnect there at the moment in terms of our communication. I really like your idea as yeah. well. I think well, yes, we've, we've I'm all about engage. acting. You know, I don't like the talking, talking. It's, let's, let's do something. If we each did something, then we would, could do a lot. Yes, yes, there's a fight for the microphone. It's very exciting. <laughs> Hi, um, just to add, because the gentleman, um, one part of your question was with regards to places like Nigeria not having connectivity. I mean, I won't go into that. I've got to, but um, mobile connectivity, as far as I know, is available everywhere in Nigeria. Uh, but the good thing, what Claire, um, going addressing Claire's point about partnerships, the OTTs, the likes of um, Meta and Google, they're not in the business of selling cable capacity. They're in the business of getting people onto their network. Yeah. So they will work with local people to get eyeballs onto their network, and that is why they have partnerships across the globe. It does take time, but... I think that's the great thing about that. They want as many people to be on their network. They can't get involved in the terrestrial. They will um, partner with people like ourselves who have now got into the terrestrial networks in certain countries and other players all across the globe. So that ecosystem will continue to grow because it's not enough to build a cable and leave it at the cable landing station. It has to reach the people. Yes. So. yes. Alan? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, about get, every company should have a program uh, to g reach out to schools and, and, and other communities. Add the data center industry as well. These are oh, anonymous yes. sheds that could be secret police headquarters for all we know. Uh, they're in every suburb, but they've never any markings. They've all got high security. And I understand why it's high security, but that's where all our information is, whether it's Facebook or Google or whatever, or, you know, movies from Amazon Prime, it's all there. Nobody knows what it's there for, and it's an important part of the community. Mm. They yes, should I be agree. involved too. Yes, I agree. Yes, Kerry? Is this working? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Kerry, Kerry, Kerry has the microphone first, sorry. Hi. <laughs> yeah, working? Yes? Yeah? Good? So what, what I wanted to mention to all the companies that are in the room is that we're actively working on what we call a talent consortia uh, through the TM Forum. And anybody that's interested in that after this, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. And Nick Willits and I, who's the CEO of TM Forum, would be happy to engage with you, whether you're a university, whether you're a, a company, because this is a conundrum that we're trying to solve right now. We see it as a, a major problem in the industry. And I think as this panel rightfully set up up front. It's not that we have a brand problem, we just don't have a brand at all. Yes. We're absolutely not visible, you know, in the use cases, in the universities. We're not visible in the, you know, 13 to 16 year old realm, which is actually the important part of the uh, age group that really matters. And I think part of this consortia is to try to bring ideas together on not only how to attract these great individuals that are up on the panel here into our industry, but also how do we create the pipeline for the future. So um, happy to engage uh, more. We're building this literally as we speak. We're having a round table at DTWS next week in Copenhagen if you're there. So please feel free to join and happy to engage further. Thank you, Kerry. Yes. Hi, Isabel. Um, in my non-paid job, um, I'm a guide leader for Rainbows, which is the four to seven-year-olds. 
And I know that through the guiding program and the scouting program, they've partnerships with uh, the likes of Google, for example, to introduce at a very early age the whole concept of coding and technology into their program. So it's not about how to tie a knot. It's, you know, from a very basic level, how do you give instruction to something for them to do that? Um, and, and that's really sort of going in at a very early age, and it builds throughout certainly the, the guiding and scouting programs, both of which are worldwide movements. So we have opportunities there through our industry to, to widen that. So it's not just about computing. There's partnerships with the Royal Navy. So we can get our marine element in there as well. So we, we can build with what's already there and tap into all of the... Um, uh, talent that's in this room, both old and new. Um, and on Frankie's point, I'd like to say that uh, maybe Ed can get a TikTok going later on. Maybe we can <laughs> go viral again once our mourning period is over. <laughs> Great. There's the gentleman in the front. Um, so I think one part of the problem is, is that early engagement and awareness at an early age, but also when people do get into the industry, if you ask a young person, would you rather be in a company that is a budding office that's full of young, like-minded people, or would you be in a more disparate office that's full of people that aren't necessarily of your age? And it's true. My question, no, but it's completely, it's completely right. It's true. Yeah, my question to you guys is what, what can the industry do to keep people in because we're competing against the wider tech bubble, which serves that, you know? Yeah, and I was, one of, uh, I was one of those young people 30 years ago that was brought into the industry, because 30 years ago it was a monopoly industry, very traditional government-like industry. And it needed to transform because it was becoming a, a competitive environment. So they brought in a wave of young people and they were called catalysts in my company. And within two years, we turned the company around into one of the most dynamic telecom operator in the world. So it is doable. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Because I lived it, and I see that it can be, can, can, can be done. So this is the beginning of a wave. That's why we call it the wave. It's the beginning of the wave. And the more young people join, the more young people will want to join. So we have to get to that point where there's enough young people to make it more interesting. Because when I joined, it was one of the coolest industries that you can, could join. And we, at the different events, we try to encourage more young people to come. And it's, it's only the start. So hopefully, we will succeed. And if we talk again in one or two years' time, we'll, you know, we'll say we, we've succeeded. Yes? Um, just to build on the idea of um, visibility, I mean, there's a last year or the year before where there was an earthquake that wiped out connectivity to certain islands. Oh, no. um, there's connectivity that wiped out connectivity to, or an earthquake that wiped out connectivity to certain islands and it happens several times that. And that's when you really hear about submarine networks is when something goes wrong. Um, is there any sort of way to address that insofar as saying this is what's uh, being done to help it, this is going to either this, these sort of ideas that are going to help improve the area that you can build your own visibility on. So it's not necessarily negative for the industry, but actually a positive. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we invited them to come, actually, but they couldn't come. But yes, Nick. Nick. Nikki, maybe if you yeah, want to explain. So they, um, telecom Sunfra, I don't know too much, but they do go out to disaster areas yes. to provide connectivity to, to make sure um, people can communicate, and they work with they probably work with most of the companies here. They get um, uh, financing from companies here. It's a charity run by telecoms companies um, to help in disaster areas. So it does exist. So again, they're not making noise about what they do, but they do exist. Yeah. Is there insurance that covers sort of like those issues? You, have to, you need to talk in the microphone for the people that are watching online. Um, there's insurance that usually covers those sort of impacts, so that's obviously a very important thing, but isn't the insurance... Sorry, uh, when you say insurance, the, um, there are things that are called an act of God um, oh. in insurance, and um, an earthquake is an, is an act of God. I don't believe you'll get no. insurance cover for an act of God. <laughs> Am I correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I think we can just leave and they'll just continue. <laughs> I mean, what a great panel. <laughs> 
Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Ping here. I'm from BT. Um, so as ev everybody is saying that um, the OTT companies, because of their uh, high demand of bandwidth, they are starting like a direct partnership with all the submarine subsea companies directly. But that's not the traditional service model. So it, it is the uh, um, telecom operators who is the service providers to the OTT companies traditionally. So what do you think is the place or the role of the um, teleco or, or network operators can do better to make this um, um, transition more smoothly? Or the value the telecom companies can contribute? That's not an easy question. <laughs> Are you brave enough? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> That's his, his, his emergency message to me. Yeah. Move on. <laughs> I can, I'll, I'll give it a quick crack. And it's, it, this is a personal view. I think there's absolutely role for the uh, telcos in, in traditional. Uh, and I think it was mentioned on the previous panel uh, in terms of the infrastructure. So the CLSs, the backhauls. You know, all of those things that make up a submarine cable, it's not just beach manhole to beach manhole. There's a whole infrastructure behind it. And we've spoken about partnerships already, and I think that continued partnership of bringing that infrastructure in and tying all of the ends together is absolutely going to continue. It's not just the OTTs. Okay. That's just my view. I, I'm, I have to say, guys and girls, I'm super impressed. I'm really encouraged about the future. If you guys are the future of our industry, we're in good hands. You know, I don't know, but really, really, really impressed. And I'm not easily impressed, I can tell you. So we have 30 seconds. So just to finish on a high, one, qu one word answer. For the audience watching us today, why should they join the industry? Um, it's, it's the future. It's, it's an innovative industry. I mean, the question earlier about the spin-offs coming out of research, that's, that's going to carry on and carry on. Um, it's the critical infrastructure of tomorrow. Okay, the future? You'll oh, be sorry. fascinated daily with what kind of solutions you need to develop over the system. Yeah, uh, it's an, in, it's an innovative industry. We're always looking for how to improve. What's the next step? It's interesting. You'll find something interesting in every part of the industry. Uh, travel, and meet <laughs> it's true. It's really good. Yes. <laughs> uh, meeting lots of different people all around the world, and uh, meeting, doing, uh, looking at new cultures. It's a big part of the global community. Alex. Uh, and it's opportunity. There are so many opportunities within the submarine cable industry. It's not just one industry. It's a multitude of disciplines, and it offers young people a huge amount of opportunity to get involved in whatever they want to. Yeah. And it's fun. It's so much fun. It's full of incredible people. My friends are all jealous about my career because I met amazing people, traveled, had fun, and made a difference. What more can you want?